Hey, man, how are you? What's up? How's everything? Uh, I saw you were in Central Park today getting some work in. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I've never really been there, like, at the ball fields over there, so I figured it would be a, a cool time to get outside and get some long tossing. And I hear you got the birds going. It's getting nice. That's the problem. Everybody's ready to get out. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised it's still light out now, so. Um, so I'm going to do the formal introduction for anybody who has questions. You see, you can type them at the bottom or there's a question mark, as we do, but. How's it going, everybody? The show is currently called Boland's Bylines, um, and you'll find out why in a minute on the New York Pro Scouts channel. I'm Jesse, and we do this on Instagram Live every Monday and Thursday. And Alex Katz, you are our special guest today. You are a pitcher in the Kansas City Royals organization, St. John's alum, drafted by the White Sox in 2015, Orioles, Long Island Ducks, Team Israel, Introduce yourself to everybody here and uh, tell us about your experience with scouts and your baseball journey. Yeah, I mean, de definitely a lot of uh, a lot of great experiences with scouts, and uh, you know, especially here in the Northeast. I went to went to high school in Long Island, and then went to St. John's, not too far away in Queens. So I was dealing with the same scouts from high school all the way through the draft. Um, I think my first experience with scouts. Is it better now? I think it froze. For yeah, a you're good. <laughs> so you're I good. think my first experience with scouts was uh, when I was playing travel ball when I was 14 or 15. Caesar press spot for the Yankees saw me playing first Caesar. base. <laughs> yeah, Caesar's awesome. And uh, I was taking ground balls at first, making throws at third. And he said, hey, kid, give up first. Just pitch. Just pitch. I want to <laughs> see you off the bump. I think at that point he didn't know if I pitched or not, but he said, hey, you know, young lefty, stick with pitching. You got you got a future um, pitching. So I think a year or two later, Caesar invited me to the area code tryouts, and that was really my first time throwing in front of many multiple scouts and college coaches. Um, during that event, I think when I left, there were a hundred emails that I received from coaches and and scouts. And um, you know, before that, maybe I heard from one or two coaches. So wow. that that was a that was a huge event for me. And then just a few weeks later, I went, I got my first offer from St. John's and I committed the next day. So um, that was, that was a pretty quick process during my senior year of high school. I, I didn't really know what to expect. I, you know, I thought I was definitely going to St. John's. I didn't, I didn't realize I really even had a chance of getting drafted. I, you know, I, I wasn't too familiar with the whole process and, you know, right. what and what not what it took to get there. You know, social media wasn't as big as it is now. So yeah. it was, it's it's definitely a lot easier to compare yourself to people throughout the country or world now than, than it was even in 2012 when I was a senior. But um, we had a scrimmage game. It was like 25 degrees outside. And um, it was it was at, you know, not a not a great baseball program, you know, a weak high school. And I remember walking to the, you know, walking to the field I think our bus showed up like 10 minutes before the game. So I, I was batting third and I got like five warm up pitches on the sideline. And I, and I looked behind the plate. There were like 30 scouts there watching. Jeez. So, um, you know, that, that was, that was pretty cool. Um, I think I pitched three innings that game and struck out all nine guys that I faced. Wow. But, um, you know, I think, I think from that day forward, I realized I had a chance to get drafted because there were really no hints before that, not not even phone calls or meetings or anything like that. Um, I was offered by a few teams to get drafted out of high school and, you know, decided it might be my best opportunity to go to school. Um, went to St. John's and, you know, we had an awesome team over there. We, we won the Big East in the regular season. I got drafted after my junior year um, by the White Sox. I was with them for a few years, pitching the World Baseball Classic pitched well there then um soon after that got traded to the Orioles and was with them for a few years and then um I had an injury last year which kind of uh put me out for a few months last year but uh you know I feel better than ever now and and threw for some teams this winter and and it felt like the whole draft process again thrown for teams <laughs> but uh it all worked out and ended up signing with the Kansas City Royals which is awesome. And then everything kind of fell apart, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, so you heard right now, the show's called Boland's Bylines. We let our guests, there's a company that helps name minor league teams. So we change it every show. 
So you've got the Delmarva Shorebirds, the Winston-Salem Dash, Roger Keys, you played for all of them. So Newsday Yankees beat writer, Eric Bolin called it Bolin's Bylines, but Alex, what do we call the show today? This show? Yeah, right now. Um, playing catch with cats. I like that. Very good. All right. Catch so, with cats. Catch with cats. That's good. <laughs> that has you can, a ring you, to you, it. Try to say it as fast as you can three times. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that at the end. All right. Um, so let's talk about your journey a little bit. You're a yep. Long Island kid for New Hyde Park, and you got drafted. So you talked a little bit about that. But what was that like? You know, you said you didn't really even know that you had that opportunity. And for kids that are watching, right, they don't – they say all the time on these, how do I get seen? So what was that experience like? What was the feeling like when that happened to you? Yeah, it was uh, – honestly, so many emotions going through my head on draft day because I had a, I had a, I had a great uh, junior year. Minus one outing, you know, I had pretty pretty dominant year and then finished strong in the in the regionals. I had a good outing. And actually the last batter that I pitched against in college was Andrew Benintendi. Not so uh, the, <laughs> Golden, yeah, the Golden Spikes Award winner was my last batter that I faced in college. Um, so I, I, finished, I finished my junior year strong and, you know, I, I definitely, you know, had calls and, you know, teams said I would go in certain rounds. And then – hearing 800 names called ahead of you is pretty frustrating, you know, yeah. and then, and then huge, huge sigh of relief when, when, you know, they call your name, I, there was a point during the draft where I didn't even think I was going to get drafted for some reason. I think some teams maybe thought I was going back for my senior year, but um, definitely one of the craziest days of my life, frustration combined with, you know, one of the happiest days of my life. So um, definitely so many emotions that day. So we just got – we'll take some audience questions as we go, but someone said, did you win that at bat or did Ben Attendee win that at bat? Um, he has a lifetime batting average of zero against me in three at bats. Nice. There you go. <laughs> ho ho so, ho hopefully he could get some more chances against me or I could get more chances against him. But um, 100%. That's um, the goal. So let's jump to last year. You said you were injured a little bit. You played independent ball, and that was kind of a really interesting time to be playing in the Atlantic League. Uh, with the Ducks, you won the championship, and you were one of the younger guys in the league. So how did you end up taking that step to Long Island, and you're from Long Island? What was that like? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, it was definitely the next best thing besides signing with an affiliated team. Um, I obviously got drafted in 2015, so had – you know, already 200 innings under my belt in the minor leagues. But, um, you know, I, I still believe that the Atlantic League and the competition and, you know, just being surrounded by those people was a, a huge stepping stone in my career. Um, I think the competition was better than any uh, low A or high A ball that I, that I played against. It definitely, um, you know, I pitched in some big league spring training games and, you know, some of these, some of these at-bats in the Atlantic League, you know, not from – the leadoff guy to the nine hole, but you know, some of these guys that you're pitching against really know what they're doing. You know, these guys just came off big league, um, big league contracts or currently playing overseas in Korea or Japan. So, you know, th these guys know what they're doing. I was, you know, I was the youngest on the ducks team for most of the season. And then I think probably top two or three youngest in the whole league. So um, I felt like an experienced player getting drafted in 2015, but I was by far the, you know, one of the least experienced players. But, you know, just playing with and against those guys with, you know, the amount of service time and uh, knowledge that they have, you, you learn so much from those guys. That was my next question. So what's it like? You're like the youngest guy there, and most of those players have been in the big leagues even for a cup of coffee. What was that experience like as the younger guy, and what did you take away from some of those other older players? Yeah, no, just keeping my ears – ears open just listening to everything I mean th there's definitely notable names on that team John Neese TJ Rivera um Kirk Neuenheis uh, Matt, De <laughs> Matt Dendecker yeah a yeah. lot of Mets players and you know those are guys who are on the Mets you know when I was in high school and then maybe beginning of college so um, I grew up a Mets fan you know pretty lived only about 15-20 minutes from City Field so um you know that's, that was pretty cool to, to pick those guys brains and, and learn so much from them so 
the Atlantic League last year was kind of the testing ground for some of the new proposed rules that MLB is considering implementing. How did you feel like, you know, stealing first base or any of that? What did you notice and what was interesting to you as compared to minor league ball you were playing before? Yeah, so they were implementing a lot of those rules in the second half of the season. I, uh, I, I only pitched the first half. I was, I, was, uh, I was on the IL for the second half of the season. So I wasn't there when they had – or I, wasn't, I was there, but I wasn't pitching when um, they had the robo-umpires. Um, there were actually – there was a double header where they used baseballs with a little bit of stick on them. They were major league really? baseballs. Um, they definitely didn't go as far. The balls, the leather was definitely softer than a regular major league ball. Um, second half, they implemented stealing, um, stealing first at any time. Um, although I only saw it happen once or twice because uh, it counts as an offer for the hitter. So unless they really need to get on, like as a tie game or um, extra innings, the guy's really not going to steal first. Um, no pickoffs. I. I don't really understand that rule. There, there are yeah. definitely some rules, you know, that they implemented that I agree with, some that I don't. Um, I think the robo-ump can be good as long as it's consistent and there's um, and no delay. Uh, there was definitely a little bit of a delay. Sometimes the ball would almost, you know, be back to the pitcher before right. the umpire would, uh, you know, call it a ball or a strike. Um, yeah, no, and that, I think, is the most contentious of all the issues, but – it got pretty good reception overall. But the delay is exactly what you heard about. Did that disrupt you as a pitcher, or did you not even pitch when they had? No, that? I didn't. I didn't pitch um, the first half of the season. I'm trying to think what rules they had. Pretty much, the only rules in the first half was uh, pitch clock. You know, number of warrant pitches, right. um, stuff like that. Runner on second, which I dealt with in the minor leagues. So. Nothing really crazy in the first half when I was pitching, although I did see um, one of our pitchers um, almost get hurt because there was some sort of delay and they only let him get like one or two warrant pitches and it was about 25, de 25 degrees outside. So um, <laughs> that, was, um, that was really like the only um, flaw that I, that I saw last season besides, you know, some of the other little things. Um, here's an audience question. What is your favorite non-baseball activity? Um, right now, maybe riding my bike. I, I definitely, uh, have been riding my bike a lot. It's a good workout and nice out. Good weather. We, we had another one from someone who said, uh, what do you think of the proposed universal DH rule? Personally, I hate it. I, I love the hit. And, um, in the off season, when I'm home, me and my dad go to the, go to the field, you know, probably around once a week to, to hit, I try to, try to keep it going because you know it's one of my favorite things to do in baseball besides pitching um so you started it was called kg custom kicks now it's stadium custom kicks you've been on uh mlb network twice i think um so that's pretty cool with harold reynolds where did that whole custom cleats thing and uh you've done it for players in all different sports now how did that start and how did that grow yeah i mean pretty much my whole life um, I won't, maybe not my whole life, um, you know, maybe later on college. And then eventually when I got drafted, I always thought about, um, you know, things to do on the side, you know, a, a side business that I could do because obviously I know as a minor leaguer, you don't make much money and there's plenty of downtime playing, whether it's a bus ride or even the off season. So I thought of some ideas the year I got drafted and, um, you know, went back and forth with my dad on, you know, if it was realistic or not. And um, some of those ideas, ideas actually came to fruition, but, um, you know, they were a little bit harder or maybe I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I thought. And I actually, you know, did some stuff with some other minor leaguers. And, um, and then the next year or after my first full season, I was invited to play in the World Baseball Classic. Um, I didn't pitch in the qualifiers, but I was then selected to play in, on the main tournament. Um, so at that point, the highest level I played at was high A just for a month, um, the last month of my first full season. And, you know, I never pitched in front of more than three, four or 5,000 fans before. And now I was pitching in front of 60,000 fans and the whole yeah. world on, on TV. So I thought it was a cool, um, a cool time to rock some cool looking cleats. I was with the White Sox. So um, pretty bland colors. We had to pretty much wear solid black cleats. If there was really, <laughs> exactly, not, not even white. 
if it, the cleats literally had to be solid black. So you couldn't even, you could wow. barely even see what brand cleats they were. So, um, you know, that was probably the one rule I didn't like. Cause I like to, I like to wear, I'm a big footwear guy. So, um, you know, once I was invited to world, play in the world baseball classic, I thought it was a good idea to customize my cleats and basically creating my one pair and, up, um, you know, into the start of, uh, a legitimate business now, you know, it really just started small and, um, teammates and friends ordered charging them like 10 bucks just to change colors and um, you know now we're we have a team of nine artists and 23 people total helping out including a, a bunch of other big league and minor leaguers working with us so um, it, it's definitely more than I've ever could imagine and it, it's still growing. So talk about the direction of the game with things like Players Weekend and becoming more accessible they're miking players up now i think you like drone videography they're all doing drone stuff now um so given your background you're in the atlantic league you saw some of that they're trying to get younger what do you think about everything and what excites you um i think i think they're doing a great job but there could be a lot more things that they could do i feel like um you know i feel like social media is such a powerful powerful platform um I feel like as long as they could tie together the, you know, the star players from each team, um, you know, I, f I feel like as long as, um, you know, there's quality content out there and you understand the personal side to these players, um, you know, I feel like the younger kids are going to, um, you know, start playing baseball. I, I personally think um style and and custom cleats and stuff like that is, is really going to help grow the game and we actually have a lot of collaborations with major league baseball coming up um they're, they're still in the works but they're trying to use us because we're one of their we're one of three official customizers for the league um, right. so they're trying to kind of use us to help grow the game in, in certain aspects because they know that um you know fashion and and style are so important in basketball and football you know, you see you see pictures of LeBron James walking into the arena, rocking a pair of, of, of kicks, and now that kid wants to be exactly like LeBron. So um, if you could really um, change the culture and remove some of the blandness of baseball, I feel like that's how you're going to grow the game. Um, but I feel like if the game – I feel like with some of these rules, I feel like the game is kind of heading in the wrong direction. Um you know, not the right direction. So there's definitely a lot of positives and negatives going on within the game that, um, you know, that are affecting the, the participation rate. So, and you've leveraged the power of social media, like you were saying the last couple of years and things have changed drastically, even in, you know, the three or four years that I look back, but you're on Cameo, you have a lot of sponsorship product deals on Instagram. How do those things come about? for you, I mean, you're not Mike Trout, right? So how did those things on the smaller side come about? And how did you learn to navigate the business side of your career? Yeah, I think I think networking is huge. Um, you know, I created a, a LinkedIn in college, I was a business and uh, I studied business and sport management at St. John's. Um, so we had to take a lot of classes and, you know, relating to business marketing and stuff like that. So one of my classes made us make a LinkedIn page. Um, I didn't really understand the importance of it. So I just basically created for the class and left it alone for about three or three to five years. Didn't touch it. Um, I think this past year I, um, you know, fixed it up a little bit, probably spent five, 10 minutes just fixing it up and just connected with some really cool people in the sports industry. Um, between that, you know, playing in different organizations, um, just meeting different people, learning about different websites. Um, I wouldn't really say I'm tied to any single company or, or anything like that. I feel like I just, you know, as things come up, I, I like to make those adjustments and, and, and try them out. You know, like Cameo, someone messaged me on Instagram uh, from the company and said, hey, you should sign up. And, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not any sort of celebrity, but you know, maybe there's some people that are fans of a minor league team that maybe want something like that. So I think I've done two of those. Um, you know, there's some websites where you basically enter your social media handles and it, it calculates the worth of a, or the value of a, a post. And there's probably a hundred, there's like a hundred, 150 brands on there, you know, small brands, big brands. And they're basically looking at 
you know, all these athletes on there and they basically send messages to the athletes that they want to work with. So, you know, there have definitely been some, some cool brands I work with and uh, promoted on social media. So a couple more audience questions here. So this one's cool. As an, uh, uh, an indie ball player, what do you have to do or what's your best advice to get back into affiliated ball? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I feel like, League, the league you're in it, it is very important although that's not the really end all be all you know that's not saying that you can only get signed out of a out of a good independent league but there are definitely different levels of independent leagues um i feel like playing in a higher level will increase the value of you know increase your value as a player in the atlantic league with the ducks i think we had like 24 guys signed since uh last year between the season and the off season so you know, pretty much, pretty much everyone got signed into a Philly ball or Mexico from there. Um, you know, there were some guys that went to Korea and Japan that were on the team. Um, but, you know, there are definitely guys in other leagues like the Can-Am League and American Association that get signed. I think it's pretty much just, you know, do well. And, you know, obviously velocity is so important. So I, I feel like the combination of having good stuff putting up good numbers, you're going to get seen because I think there are, I think most teams do have scouts that scout just them independent leagues. Um, you know, so I feel like if you're good enough, your, your name will get out there. Um, you know, just because one affiliate, one of, you know, major league organization doesn't need a player now, doesn't mean in two weeks they, they won't need that guy or a guy in your position. Um, so we saw a couple of these. Have you been watching the KBO? Would you want to play in the KBO? What do you, I know you played in Korea and Japan, which we'll talk about in a minute, but what's that all about? Have you been watching any? Yeah, I've been, I, I watched the, the first game, but the timing is so off. I don't want to stay up till four in the morning to watch. Um, <laughs> I definitely enjoy the game over there. Um, I think I would play in Japan. I don't think they really sign American relief pitchers in, in Korea. So maybe towards the end of my career, I'd, you know, I'd consider playing in Japan. But obviously, you would need some AAA or a major league time to get there. They're not going to take a guy with uh, you know, lower-level minor league experience. So uh, you played for Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic in 2017. You ended up making Aliyah and becoming a citizen. Um, what's it like to play with a country's name on your chest and what overall impact has that had in your life? Yeah, definitely one of the coolest experiences of my life. Um, you know, playing in, you know, many different countries, representing a country is, is like no other feeling. Um, you know, I never represented anything other than a college or a major league organization. Um, you know, that obviously is a ton. You're representing a ton right there, but to represent a whole country is is pretty incredible. Um, and so what was that like versus, you know, playing a normal game? What was the competition like? Did it differ a little bit? Yeah, so I didn't I didn't pitch in the – shout out to Gary Perrone. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we were in uh, – we we're in Brooklyn for those qualifiers. I didn't, I didn't pitch in the qualifiers um, because, you know, there I was the second youngest on the whole team and, you know, we didn't really get much practice beforehand. So uh, they pitched, we only played three games. They pitched all the, you know, guys with, with big league time and they did a good job cause we won. So, you know, there's nothing to be to complain about at all, but um, the competition was very mixed there. Um, some countries are better than others. Some were deeper than others. Um, you know, like a team like Pakistan, we didn't play against, but, you know, none of those guys really, you know, played high level of competition. You know, I'm not sure if they even have a league there. None of those guys obviously played in, in the U S but a team like Brazil had, you know, Bo Bichette on the team, Dante Bichette right. and some other big leaguers. So, you know, I'm not sure how deep they were from one to nine, but, you know, at least from two to four, you know, there were some legit hitters in that lineup. Same with Great Britain. Um, so the, the competition was very mixed in the qualifiers in the WBC. Um, it was also kind of mixed, but, you know, like a higher level of, of mix, you know, because probably the weakest team that we played was, was Chinese Taipei, but they still had, you know, very good players from the Taiwanese, Taiwanese league on their team. 
you know, when we played Team Japan, it was literally every all-star from Japan. Right. And that's, you know, that's top two, top three leagues in the whole world. I think they're the number one ranked national team in the world. Um, and then Netherlands had an all-star lineup. They had Diego Gregorius, oh, yeah. Jonathan Scope, Simmons, Bogarts. It's Curacao, um, Valentin. <laughs> it's Curacao. Yeah, no, those those guys were deep. So I think the main WBC tournament was was pretty legit. You know, there were a lot of high-end players in that tournament. Um, so you're sort of like a baseball chameleon, right? In a few short years, you've played in so many different environments. Uh, you have your dream of playing in the majors. You're getting back into affiliated ball, but you're, no matter how, how hard it is, you're smiling, you're persevering, working hard. So what advice can you give to younger players watching? What keeps you going? Yeah, I think it's just learning learning from your mistakes and not letting those mistakes keep repeating themselves. Um, I think it's really important to take notes. Um, you know, I see a lot of guys, you know, from high school all the way through professional baseball, um, you know, fixing something and then causing another bad habit. So not to say I never done that before, but, you know, I've done a better job of taking notes, becoming a self coach, being aware of my body, Early in my career, I relied on coaches and other people to tell me what I was doing wrong. But I've learned just in the last year, you know, so already years into my pro career that I have to understand my body. And, um, you know, I think I've learned more over the last year than the, my whole career from Little League on. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, just all the technology that we have, taking video and being able to see how my body works best. And you've played, I mean, we had Coach Ed Blankmeyer, the new Cyclones manager. We had him on a couple weeks ago. You played for him at St. John's. You had uh, Wally Backman last year. So what impact of them or other managers that you've had? I know Jerry Naren was like uh, a coach on Team Israel, right? What have they had on yeah. your career and what sticks out for you from those kind of guys? Yeah, I've played for some awesome coaches and managers just in my uh, short playing career already from the Cape Cod League through college, Team Israel, and then, um, you know, three major league organizations, different levels from each organization. Um, you know, so I've played for some awesome coaches. And you just – you you learn that every coach has their own philosophy, but they – all the – you know, all the good ones really preach the same thing. And – um you know, they know how to bring a group of individuals together, no matter how talented they are, you know, because our, our team Israel team, we, you know, Coach Jerry Weinstein wasn't the most talented team in the whole tournament. We had a lot of talent on the team, and a lot of those young guys will be in the big leagues in the next couple of years. Um, but we definitely weren't the most talented team, but we still started off 4-0 and and went from being the last ranked team to top six, one game away from the tournament. Um, you know, with St. John's too, uh, Coach Blackmire was able to um, consistently, you know, for 26, 27 straight years, you know, bring a group of Northeast ball players and have them compete against teams in the South. You know, my first start in college was against, was against the number one team in the country, UNC. You know, we competed against those schools. You know, we, we, we might have lost a few games early on while, you know, while we weren't hot. But, you know, mid-season, end of the season, when, it count, when the games counted, conference play, regionals, you know, we were winning games. And, um, you know, he was able to get the most out of, all, out of, out of everybody. Talk to me about, because uh, this is a conversation we have a lot, youth baseball showcases versus playing, you know, local leagues. What was your experience with all of that? Uh, I know nowadays, and especially with, the pandemic people maybe don't have the money to shell out thousands of dollars to go around the country. So what was your experience in youth baseball and what do you think about the way that it's currently structured? Um, I, I currently hate it. I think um, all these showcases are pretty overrated just, just cause you know, my experience, there were definitely um, showcases that tried getting me in. I think I paid 500 bucks for a showcase and I was already committed to a school but they wouldn't give me my money back. You know, you could tell it was all about the money and there were about 300 kids. So I don't think my $500 was going to make it or break it for them. Um, but like I said, the best showcase for me was area code and was area code. And that was completely free. Um, so from my experience, if you're good, you're going to get seen. 
there's enough information out there. You know, every college coach's email address is public. Um, you know, if, if I'm in high school and I'm throwing 90 miles per hour, 15 years old, 16 years old, and I send a video to a Division One school, there's no reason they're not going to take another look. Um, I think what some kids don't understand is that, you know, you – you have you're not realistic you know you have to find a school that you know you know you're going to play at you know that you're good enough to play there um you know i think there's a college for pretty much every solid ball player you know you don't have to be the best of the best to play in college there's so many different levels out there um i feel like the problem with some of these younger kids is that they're not realistic so the first thing is obviously work as hard as you can get the most out of your talent you know and then once it comes to the point where you have to pick a school, I think you have to be realistic and definitely um, get your name out there the best you can. You know, because like I said, if you're good enough for that school, that coach is going to give you a second look. Well, and Coach Blank said when we had him on, he was talking about for him, he was drafted in like the 20 something round by the Orioles back in, in the 70s. And he said after one year, it's not that he couldn't have kept playing. It's that he had to be realistic about one, how good he was versus the competition, and then two, what did he want to do? And he found that coaching was something that he enjoyed, so he went back and, and coached college, and then obviously St. John's for all those years. So can you already kind of alluded to it, but talk about being realistic with yourself. It's a really hard thing to do, but can you just talk to that? Yeah, for sure. I think that's really the most important thing, no matter how good you are. Um, you know, I feel like Mike Trout is honest with himself. Um, I feel like a guy like that is never going to be satisfied, and that's why he produces year after year. Um, you know, I think no matter what level you're at, you have to be honest because there's always room for improvement. So, um, you know, I could have signed with the Royals and been, been satisfied thinking that, you know, whatever I did already was good enough to be in their system and, and work my way up, but – I took it the completely opposite way. You know, I basically congratulated myself for five seconds and then went back to work. Um, you know, practice just as hard or harder than when I was trying to get signs. You know, so I, I feel like it's just, it's, it's about understanding where you've come from, looking forward to the future, but thinking short term, how am I going to work my way up to get there? Um, you know, my, I'm not thinking right now, like, Hey, how am I going to have a 10 year career in the big leagues? It's how am I going to put up good numbers and dominate at whatever level that the Royals put me at, you know, because I know I'm with the double A triple A team right now. And I know how far I've gone, how close I am. So I don't want to be that guy that, you know, in 20 years is just telling people, Oh, you know, I, I was one call away. Um, you know, I just made it. I want to be that guy that, um, you know, said I worked my, my ass off. People didn't, people didn't think I would ever get back into affiliate ball, you know, especially after an injury. Um, you know, I, I never gave up and I just kept, uh, you know, chasing my dreams. So uh, we've had this question come up a couple of times on some of these from kids or from, you know, Gary's a parent. What are your favorite drills to be doing? Maybe kids don't have an L screen or they don't have a T, but, just simple stuff you can be doing at home uh, during this. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really good question. Um, it obviously depends on where you live and what access you have. I think the first thing is um, figuring out what access you have and, and making the most of it. So, you know, my local high school, um, the rules change all the time, but whatever is open, I make the most of it. So, you know, if I go there and they say only the track is open, you know, now I have a whole track to run on. Um, you know, obviously they, they're not shutting down the road. So I ride my bike and, you know, I find, I find a way to get my work in. So I think it's having a determination and finding a way to get your work done. Um, you know, I don't think there's any magic drills out there. Um, personally, obviously I have a routine, a warrant routine and, you know, maybe change up my drills based on what I'm going to work on. But, you know, I feel like, it. you know, you have to understand what you need to fix, not just doing eyewash drills that you see other kids doing, you know, because just because you're doing it doesn't mean it's going to help me. It could actually make me worse. So, 
you know, there's really not any specific drills that I like to work on. It's pretty much just doing my basic catch play and throwing on the mounds, taking video. I think, I think the best drill or piece of equipment is the iPhone. Uh, you could get, you could even get a $15 tripod on Amazon, a cheap one, and just set your phone up on there and you don't even need someone else. All you need is a, a screen or a fence and, uh, and your phone and take some video and you could really, no matter how much you know about baseball, you could, you know, you could tell if it looks good or not. If the ball's all over the place, then there's something wrong with your mechanics. You don't really have to know anything about baseball. Just keep trying new things until something works. That's really what I did. You know, obviously I have a lot of experience, you know, over the past few years with pitching, but I've changed my mechanics so many times. It's incredible until I figure out something that works best for me. Um, great advice. And you're always open to continuing to adapt in the game, which uh, is something we talk about with scouts. You know, there's this conversation that happens all the time about our scouts getting phased out or the analytics and the answers we get from the ones that stay in the game is you just have to be open and willing to adapt. So at 100%, it applies, I guess, to a player too. Not surprising. Absolutely. If, if you don't adapt – um, the game quickly passes by you because there, there's people that are always willing to adapt. And I've seen that with big league pitching coaches. I've, I've talked to some big league pitching coaches, some old school ones. And, you know, those guys are adapting to the, to the new times because they know that there's a younger coach out there that's going to be hungry and, and study everything. Yeah. Phil so, Reagan with the Mets, right? Last year was like 80. Yeah. The, yeah. The, guy, the guys love him. Um, the guy knows, clearly knows what he's talking about. And, didn't have to, you know, if he wanted to, he didn't really have to, he could have shut his ears for the last 15 years with, you know, he had, he already had probably 30, 40 years of pro baseball experience under his belt, but that's a guy that I'm sure continued to learn throughout his career, even into his eighties. So next part of the show is rapid fire. So I'm going to give you a couple of things quickly. You tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, I'll take an audience one from before first. What's your favorite food? I like pizza. Uh, favorite player growing up? Uh, Billy Wagner. Favorite fruit? Fruit, mango. Nice. Um, if you were reborn in a new life, would you rather be alive in the past or in the future? Uh, probably future. How come? I feel like um, there's so many new, cool new things that are coming out every year um, that obviously make life easier. So um, I think uh, it would be cool to see how technology changes and stuff like that. Uh, what is your Desert Island album and why? Desert Island album? Like a song? Like you get one album, music album, you're stranded on a desert island the rest of your life. What are you picking and why? Um, I like stick figure. Mu I like every type of music, but I like stick figure. It's like, uh, it's like contemporary reggae. Nice. Um, I think it's pretty solid. I, I, like I said, I like every genre. I have pretty much every artist on my phone, but I think I have probably around eight or nine songs of theirs. Favorite stadium you've ever played in? Um, maybe City Field. And when, when did you play there? That was uh, my freshman year. At, well, I, pit, I played there twice. One was a workout with the Mets, and then uh, the second time was uh, St. John's or Stony Brook my freshman year. Um, you did well with that. So we got a couple questions, and then we're going to do baseball cards. I'll show you some cards. You tell me what comes to mind about the players. But what has your experience with coronavirus been? Were you in Arizona with the Royals, or did you not get out there yet? Yeah, I was out there for two weeks. Um, they took it pretty slow with us. I only threw two bullpens and then was about to throw a live BP the day that they canceled it. So um, – you know, it's definitely um, – I feel like it's affected everybody in, in some way. But, um, you know, pretty much just treating it like an off season leading up to spring training, trying to stay ready for whenever we get the call. Do you have any thoughts on any of the proposals people have been asking what you think about bringing baseball back and maybe not having a full minor league season? Yeah, I mean, I haven't pitched in a game since June because of the injury. <laughs> Um, I've been ready for a while because I got the surgery August 16th and was thrown in October already. Um, so I've been ready to throw for a long time. So there's a lot of anticipation. Personally, 
I don't care if there's a minor league season or not. I just want to, even if the games don't count, I just want to get on the mound and, and, and pitch the hitters. I, you know, I want to play. It seems, as time goes on, it seems like a major league season is likely, but a minor league season is not very likely. It seems like there might be some sort of fall league at the complexes. Um, but I'll definitely take that over sitting at home, um, just throwing bullpens. And what's the best thing that's happened to you since, uh, since this all started? Um, I feel like my changeup has improved drastically. I, um, I'm that's the most be... baseball answer we've gotten, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I'm doing, just training baseball and then trying to grow the business. Um, definitely some cool things on the business side. But, um, you know, as far as baseball, my, my changeup feels nice and sharp right now. And that's a pitch it probably took seven years to develop, maybe more but I feel like I finally figured out a little bit. Here's an audience question. Do you like the process of going pro, playing in the minor leagues, riding buses? Uh, do you like that? How has it been? Has it been hard at times? I mean, I'd be lying if I said I love bus rides, but um, I would definitely rather be playing baseball than, than sitting at a desk all day. So I enjoy playing baseball. Um and if I make it to the big leagues, you got to say you love the process, right? Because the process worked. So um, I feel like it's too early to answer. You are uh, you got a lot of knowledge in that brain, and you're able to concisely put it down. I like that. Um, and, and that's everybody saying they're really they're taking away a lot from this. So uh, is there anything that a catcher should know when they catch? So from the mind of a pitcher, what advice would you give to a catcher? Um, I feel like my best advice would be to get to know all of your pitchers. Um, I feel like that's super, super important. And I've had catchers that don't, didn't really care. And it really sucked throwing to them because they were not on the same page as you, just throwing down signs. But when the catcher really gets to know their pitcher and, you know, in the clubhouse before the game or after the game, you know, talking to your pitchers, what do you like to throw? You know, what kind of – like, what's your what's your game plan like? because everybody has different game plans and sequences. I feel like just being on the same page as a pitcher is one of the most important things. Um, let's see. This one is favorite pitch to throw. Uh, probably two different pitches. I like uh, blowing fastballs by guys because <laughs> uh, obviously everybody throws hard, but I feel like I'm throwing harder when I, when I do. Because even if I'm throwing 94, 95, it, Sometimes it feels like I'm throwing 85 because everybody's used to it. But um, probably a slider just because um, I think I think in college I only gave up one hit on that pitch my whole college career. I, wow. think, it was at, I think it was at LIU. So that's, that's probably my best pitch. And, um, you know, if there was – if I th maybe if I threw it 90 and uh, there was no chance of, you know, it wasn't a high-stress pitch, maybe I'd throw it every pitch. Um, what is, I keep seeing this. What is your story? I know you did an interview with Zach Campbell. I, uh, my Zach Campbell story is a little, a little silly, but what is your Zach Campbell story? Are you still in touch with him? Yeah. I was actually with him today at Central Park. We were long really? tossing. Yeah. Yeah. We, tr we try to, um, when I was growing up, I used to go to the, to Shea Stadium and City Field like three hours before the game and watch batting practice, try to catch balls. Um, I still have all those balls and have, you know, big garbage cans downstairs. And I use most of those in my, in my practice, but, um, you know, that's where I met Zach. And since I got drafted, he followed me throughout my career. Um, he expects me to toss him 50 balls per game when I get to the big leagues. <laughs> um, but you know, he's come to a bunch of, he tries to come to at least one or two minor league games per year and do a video. We got him credentials and he, uh, gets to the ballpark when I get there and we, we do some cool content together. And, um, you know, that, that has definitely helped brand, brand me. I think, uh, you know, I, I credit him with definitely, uh, you know, having a, a good amount of followers, um, I think due to a lot of his videos, because some of those videos have, you know, three, 400,000, maybe a million views. Wow. He used to work for uh, the league doing blog stuff like 20 years ago. He was like one of the original guys <laughs> that worked for MLB.com when it first started out. So he's got a lot of experience over the years with just how it's changed. So, Yeah, no, he, he's a really good writer. That's, that's how I've heard of him through the MLB blogs. Um, 
but obviously YouTube is a big thing right now. He came over to me in 2016 at the Home Run Derby in San Diego. Um, I used to do StatCast, so I was in the commissioner's box, and I'm standing kind of, it was in, you know, in San Diego, they have the warehouse with yep. the, the level, so we're standing there, and he's, he comes over, he's like, hey, man, hey, and I look over, and it's Zach, and he goes, can you go, can you go get Chris Russo for me? I got to talk to him. I'm like, I can't, I don't know what, he wanted to tell him off, I guess Chris Russo had been uh, mean to him, so we wanted to, <laughs> oh, man. to have a heated argument with Chris Russo. <laughs> Is that is that the that's a mad dog? Yeah, exactly. That's funny. Um, all right, so we're gonna do baseball cards. I know it's dark, so I don't know if you can see him, but I'm gonna I'll tell you who it is. So first one is Johan Santana. First thing that comes to mind. Uh, change up, nasty change up. Um, Mike Alt. Mike Alt, that's my guy right there. <laughs> Give uh, me more great. than that. <laughs> Why is he uh, a guy? Amazing bat rep. He sell. He's worked. He works for Chandler now. Nice. Um, Wally Backman. We talked about him, but what comes to mind first? Uh, legend. <laughs> um, he's a he, he's a celebrity on YouTube also. Ike Davis. Ike Davis. Um, another another great guy. Um, first thing that comes to mind is probably his rookie year with the Mets. And then these two guys, first Adam Jones, you made cleats for. Yep, yep. Um, funny guy right there. And what were the uh, cleats? We pro we made him like six pairs. We actually just made sent him out a pair this morning to Japan. Um, really? The first pair we did for him was Monarch shoes that we got cleats put on them and then uh, painted food and junk, junk food and healthy food all over them because he's a big foodie. <laughs> All right, and last baseball card, David Wright. You made cleats for him, too. Talk about that. Yeah, I'd say really down-to-earth, um, soft-spoken guy. Um, and I grew up a big fan of his, and then we ended up making his final pair of cleats. We made him the cleats that he hung up, so that was, uh, uh, that was, pretty, that was pretty cool. Have you, uh, have you had any of your cleats in the Hall of Fame or anything like that yet? Um, I'm not sure because I don't, I don't think they display everything that they get. Um, I'm sure over the years, I feel like there's got to be at least one pair, maybe like a player's weekend pair that um, is in Cooperstown. But, you know, maybe I'll just make myself a crazy pair and, and mail it to them. <laughs> um, MLB The Show, people are asking about MLB The Show. Are you a video gamer? Um, not really. Not really. I, I I do play once in a while, but um, I'm not a huge fan of video games. Um, all right. So we have gotten through a whole bunch of things. I'll ask you my last question that we ask everybody here. What does baseball mean to you, Alex? Um, obviously, besides family and friends, um, probably, you know, one of the most important things to me Um you know, it, it's given me a career and it, it's something and most people don't like their job. So for me, it's it's my job and my number one passion. And um, I feel like there's nothing more valuable than 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 having that, you know, because I've definitely grown up with family members, um, you know, relatives hating their jobs and just, you know, waiting to get home from work every day. But um, for me, it's it's something I truly enjoy and you know, whether it's playing and, and, you know, doing custom shoes, they both involve baseball. So, um, you know, I feel like as long as I'm working, I'm going to do something related to baseball. Um, before we go, and I'm going to try and say the, uh, the title three times fast, or maybe we'll both try and say it three times fast there. Um, we're doing a contest and we got a hashtag show us how you baseball we're trying to get people just to kids out there. We've got scouts looking at their videos, um, sending them a positive message. So we've got until the 27th for everybody. If you still want to send in your video, we'll check it out. We'll repost it. Just tag New York Pro Scouts and say, show, uh, show us how you baseball with the hashtag. Um, you can win a Bobby Valentine sign baseball. We got a, um, a bobblehead. We've got all kinds of fun stuff. So. Uh, we record these. We're going to release them later. We got Jim Duquette coming on Thursday. Alex, we said catch with cats. 
Is that the is that our title? Uh, Dan Palumbo said, "Cat says corner." Cat says corner. All right, so we might have to change it to that. We'll go with cats is corner, but try. You said three times fast, so try and say catch with cats three times fast. Catch with cats, catch with cats, catch with cats. Very nice, awesome, man. Um, all right, is there anything that we didn't get to that you think advice or anything else for people before we go? I think we covered all the bases. What do you think? I think so too. You got a thumbs up from Christy at the Daily News. You got Billy Blitzer with the Cubs saying good job. So I think we did it. Um, nice. So- for Katz's Corner, I'm Jesse. Alex, thank you so much, and we'll uh, see everybody on Thursday with Jim Duquette. Have a good Sounds night, man. Take care.